Um, this is Greenhouse Gases. I am the co-president of Sustainability Club. My name is Anna. Hi everyone, I'm Joseph. I'm the other co-president of Sustainability Club. Hi, my name is Wendy and I'm an environmental volunteer. What are greenhouse gases? So greenhouse gases are gas that contribute to the greenhouse effect by absorbing infrared radiation like carbon dioxide. What are, what are greenhouse gases? So greenhouse gases are the gases in the atmosphere that trap heat. They let sunlight pass through the atmosphere, but they prevent the heat that the sunlight brings from leaving the atmosphere. And the main greenhouse gases that we're gonna talk about in this lesson are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. So this is an image depicting the process of just how the earth works with the um, greenhouse gases. So as you can see, the sun emits light, uh, light radiation, and that is absorbed onto the earth's surface. And some of it is reflected out back into the uh, exosphere and out in the outer space. The infrared radiation, which is also known as heat, is then also absorbed onto the planet. And instead of it being able to leave the atmosphere so easily, like the light, it's then recycled and absorbed back into the planet because of the presence of the greenhouse gases. Some though, however, of the heat is able to exit um, from the top of the atmosphere, but most of it is absorbed through the greenhouse gas. So what are the main greenhouse gases? Like Joseph said, the main, main greenhouse gases are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. Water vapor is H2O, it's water in gas form, and this is what forms clouds and rains back down water onto Earth. Um, carbon dioxide, CO2, it is made up of carbon and oxygen, two oxygen mo molecules and one carbon. And um, it's part of the carbon cycle, so it comes from decaying and living organisms. So basically when we chop, chop down, <laughs> sorry, when you chop down a tree, um, that tree uses photosynthesis because it's a plant. And um, for photosynthesis, it requires CO2 to carry it out. And um, when you chop down the tree, the soda, sorry, the CO2 that it absorbed for photosynthesis goes back, it gets emitted back into the atmosphere. And so that um, contributes to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Also um, fossil fuels. So when you're driving your car, um, a car uses gas and gas emits car, uh, CO2, which is a fossil fuel back into the atmosphere. We also have methane, CH4. This is one carbon molecule and four hydrogen molecules. And it is released in wetlands, bogs, mining coal, and raising cattle. It's released in wetlands, bogs, and mining coal because these are all low oxygen um, environments. Um, and then in raising cattle, um, cows after eating something um, during digestion, they release uh, methane. We also have ozone, this is O3, it's three oxygen molecules. This is found in the atmosphere. This protect, protects us from the sun's radiation. So um, without the ozone, the sunlight would go straight into the earth. We'd be absorbing those ultraviolet rays and we could develop um, problems such as cancer, which is um, really a terrible situation that can cause us to die. We also have nitrous oxide, this is um, two nitrogen molecules, one oxygen, and um, this is made by bacteria in the soil and ocean. And then lastly, we have chlorofluorocarbons, which are also known as CFCs for short. These are fluorinated gases that damage the protective ozone layer. And um, if they damage the ozone layer, then um, the sunlight radiation can just go straight onto Earth instead of um, being blocked by the ozone and that would be an example of what would cause us to absorb um, ultraviolet radiation. What is the greenhouse effect? The greenhouse effect is the trapping of the sun's warmth in a planet's lower atmosphere due to the greater transparency of the atmosphere to visible radiation from the sun than to infrared radiation emitted from the planet's surface. So the greenhouse effect is a process that occurs when gases in Earth's atmosphere are trapping the sun's heat. 
This process causes the global temperature of Earth to be higher than if it did not have an atmosphere. So for example, Earth's temperature is a lot warmer than Mars is. A moderate amount of greenhouse gases allows that the Earth to be a comfortable place to live. So meaning that the weather is not too hot or too cold and allows us to live in optimal conditions for all of life, all of the organisms on the planet. However, though, on the flip side, there's if there's too many greenhouse ga gases in the atmosphere, it can cause a process known as global warming because they trap too much heat into the planet and it rises the global temperature up. This is what damages the environment the most. So gas in the um, Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is composed of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% of other gases. And the other gases are um, argon, neon, helium, hydrogen, as well as the greenhouse gases. And uh, moderate, monitoring the gases in Earth's atmosphere is important due to how toxic greenhouse gases can be for humans. So um, back to that mini bullet point, we got to note that although greenhouse gases make up less than 1% of Earth's atmosphere, their ability to trap heat can cause them to be very lethal in high amounts because it can lead to heat waves among other um, natural disasters that warmer te temperatures lead to. And greenhouse gases can be toxic because of the high levels of pollution that they can carry. And that can mess with their respiratory systems or how we breathe. So um, if the if we're inhaling all these toxins and we can't breathe correctly that can cause us to suffocate and if we cannot if we're suffocating and we cannot breathe that can cause us to die this is in the earth's atmosphere according to nasa chlorofluorocarbons were discovered to be the major cause of the destruction of the ozone it is important to note that other gases such as carbon dioxide and methane do have little effect on the ozone layer this is also important because the ozone layer protects us from excess heat and radiation from the sun. In addition, the Earth's atmosphere protects life on Earth from ultraviolet rays from the sun, and that basically makes our days cooler and our nights warmer. So the ozone layer, the ozone, ozone layer is a gas, or it's a gas in the atmosphere that is responsible for absorbing most of the harmful rays of the sun. The layer is composed of three oxygen molecules all binded together, which is also known as an O3 molecule. And these are known as ozone molecules uh, by scientists. It's very important to limit the certain greenhouse gas emissions because they damage the ozone layer and kind of break down these O3 molecules, which means that humans will absorb these harmful rays. So it's, it can be thought of, the ozone layer can be thought of as like a natural sunscreen for the Earth. So just as we apply like sunscreen on our bodies to protect us from damage from the sun, the ozone layer protects all of the organisms on Earth from the harmful rays of the sun just without you know, having to put on the sunscreen. So this graph shows the um, carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million over a course of time starting from around 1860 until the year about 2000. And so as you can see from 1860 to 1940, there's like a slow but steady increase in carbon dioxide and parts per million. So it starts at 290 parts per million and it goes up to about 315 parts per million by 1940 or 1950-ish times. And so then after that, after 1960, and this could be because there's more humans on the earth driving cars, you know, all the um, uh, factory farming that's happening to feed and sustain the more amounts of people that are on the planet um, start to happen in excess and it leads to more parts per million of carbon dioxide being produced all the way from 1960 until 2000. It starts at 320 parts per million and increases all the way up to 365 parts per million which is a huge increase over a short span of time. So the modern history of greenhouse gases. Industrialization began major anthropogenic sources accelerating climate change because of the large amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere. And like we talked about a few lessons ago, industrialization was just the beginning of bringing industries to a large scale, such as factories producing clothing instead of people 
um, making them at home. Factories require a lot of energy and um, the type of energy that was used back then was usually non-renewable. And that means that fossil fuels were emitted that have greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. Also, um, anthropogenic just means that it's from human activity. So it began because um, humans were releasing greenhouse gases. Since industrialization began, the concentration of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere have become so much higher than they have been in the past 650,000 years. And that's really crazy to think about because um, the actions of 250 years um, being much larger than the actions of 650,000 years is just insane. That's a much, um, it just shows how much destruction we can make in um, such a little amount of time. Pre-industrial history of greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases have been emitted anthropogenically long before the Industrial Revolution. Um, for example, ancient Roman and Chinese societies released millions of tons of methane by burning plant matter to cook food, clear cropland, and process metals. So plants photosynthesize and take out carbon dioxide during the process of photosynthesis. And by clearing cropland and using plants for food, we're releasing back the carbon dioxide that the plant would have taken in. And then the amount of emissions released today is 70 times greater than that of pre-industrial history. 70 times greater is such a large amount and this is mainly due because the population has grown much larger, industrialization has happened, and we are using many more resources than before, which leads us to emit more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So some natural sources of greenhouse gases. Natural sources are, that are included that are volcanic eruptions. Um, they emit a lot of greenhouse gases, and some of the greenhouse gases that they emit are water vapor, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen chloride, and hydrogen fluoride. Um, and during winter, carbon dioxide levels increase because plants aren't able to work as efficiently uh, in photosynthetic processes. Um, so this can be because of a multitude of reasons. Um, one being that our planet during the winter is further away from the, or like in our hemisphere, we're further away from the sun the, because of the tilt of the earth, so that means there's less sunlight for available for the plants. Additionally, it takes more energy to complete photosynthetic reactions and make the uh, products of oxygen and food for the plant during the cold temperatures. And then also in addition to this, um, plants choose to go into hibernation to be a more effective method than wasting energy. And so there's um, not as much green foliage and in the green parts of plants is where most photosynthetic reactions take place. So therefore, there's just not a lot of photosynthesis happening during the winter, which allows there to be more free carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Low oxygen environments, such as swamps, bogs, and some plant really, roots uh, release methane. So as Anna mentioned, these areas when chopped down release a, a lot of methane because they're low oxygen environments. So just the carbon and the hydrogen are able to bind together easily and make methane. And then the loss of carbon sinks um, allows for more carbon to be around in the atmosphere. And so as we talked about in our deforestation lesson, um, as areas are cut down, there's, they release carbon dioxide and there's just more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since there's nothing to absorb that carbon dioxide. So like heavy forests, if they're gone, you know, that's a carbon sink. They, they can't absorb the carbon dioxide. Or if the ocean, for example, as we talked about in our ocean acidification lesson, only absorbs 30% of CO2 emissions from the, like, what's happening above land. So that still means that like 70% of the ocean emission or CO2 emissions are still in the atmosphere. So anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Anthropogenic, like I previously said, it just means originating in human activity. And this refers to um, human activity releasing an environmental pollutant. The main sources of anthropogenic greenhouse gases are burning fossil fuels, farming and forestry, cement manufacture and aerosols. And then when we look at this picture over here, we can see a chimney releasing CO2 exhaust or exhaust in the form of CO2. 
And this is an example of um, anthropogenic greenhouse gases just because it's a chimney and um, it is coming from a factory which is a human um, made factory. We, there's no natural factories where um, we're producing these greenhouse gases because of our um, actions. Anthropogenic greenhouse gases, fossil fuels. So burning fossil fuels have resulted in a large, much larger carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere than in pre-industrial history. So today we use much more energy than back then because of globalization and then the increase in population. For example, globalization allows us to travel further distances using newer technologies such as airplanes and cars and that requires us to use larger amounts of fuels and emit larger amounts of um, a larger amounts of non-renewable sources into the atmosphere as well as an increase in population in which we humans use more greenhouse gases because our population has grown so much and many of them are non-renewable once again and non-renewable is a natural resource that can be replaced at a pace fast enough to keep up with our human consumption. So over time, these resources that we're using are gonna be depleted. Um, in addition, concentrations increase at a rate of two to three parts per million per year and are currently at 390 parts per million, and which increased from 280 parts per million in pre-industrial times. This is once again a big change because it can lead to temperature increases. Finally, it is expected that the parts per million level will be anywhere from 535 to 938 parts per million by the end of the 21st century, which means a global temperature increase of 34 degrees Fahrenheit to 42 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is scary because if global temperatures increase, this will lead glaciers to melt and then regions that have mountains, they're going to experience more landslides as well as uh, sea levels are going to rise. And that makes lands that are closer to sea level to be completely cleared with water. So anthropogenic greenhouse gases with farming and forestry. Um, so as we mentioned in our deforestation lesson, deforestation accounts for around 33% of uh, carbon dioxide emissions that are ca caused by humans. Um, and so this decrease in land covering causes a decrease in the Earth's reflectivity of uh, its surface. And this is known as albedo. This means that more heat from the sun gets absorbed and results in a warmer climate area. So for example, um, uh, light that is emitted from the sun is reflected off of surfaces and that's how we perceive the surface that we're seeing. So for example, uh, plants. Um, they absorb all other wavelengths of light except for green. So that's why the leaves of plants look green because that light, the green wavelength of light is reflected back into the atmosphere. Um, whereas, for example, darker surfaces such as black are all completely absorbed. So it's just, um, for example, um, a, a road. Um, that's just all the wavelengths of light being absorbed. So it looks black. And if you've noticed, like if you step on a road, it's a lot hotter during the day than at night. At night, it's a lot cooler. And that's just because of the way that it's absorbing the um, light from the sun. Um, and what this, how this means, how this affects like areas of land is that the trees and like the leaves of plants will reflect the green light. But when that's all cut down, there's nothing to be reflected. So that just leaves the area, the valley to get really hot. And this is likely what occurred in the Mediterranean countries um, that made them very warm. So for example, um, Greece. Uh, Greece is very warm compared to the rest of Europe. And that's because of um, how all of the land was cleared or most of the land was cleared to make Mediterranean farms such as wine vineyards, um, which brought a lot of people to that area. And additionally, like fertilizers release nitrous oxide um, or N2O into the atmosphere. And that's another component of farming. And then livestock is also responsible for about 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is uh, because of two reasons. One is the deforestation to be able to allow the animals of livestock to graze or to make the space for factory farming. And also because of when they graze and eat, um, not only are they removing, like for example, grass, which makes oxygen, 
they are also um, releasing methane through their digestion. Anthropogenic greenhouse gases with cement manufacturing and aerosols. When calcium carbonate, which is a chemical compound, is heated to make cement, it produces lime and carbon dioxide. And about 5% of global carbon dioxide emissions come from the cement industry. Aerosols are released in fossil fuel combustion and have a cooling influence by blocking sunlight from reaching the surface. But one specific aerosol known as soot, which is black carbon from a large combination of impure carbon, it's the only aerosol that is known to contribute to global warming. But it's really concerning because um, soot has the uh, ability to absorb one million times more energy than um, the same amount that uh, carbon dioxide can. And that's really concerning because currently carbon dioxide is the number one um, cause of, uh, it's the number one uh, greenhouse gas that's trapping heat and causing global warming. But if we have too much soot in the atmosphere, um, it will be much more drastic. The effects, we can see them uh, much sooner which is really terrible because we want um, to make sure that global warming is um, not happening and we want to reduce its impacts as much as possible. Responses to greenhouse gases. So there are many like new laws that have been implemented. For example, the European Union uses a cap and trade system which basically means that lawmakers put a cap or a limit on the amount of greenhouse gases that can be emitted from every company, mainly carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. And then companies that emit less fossil fuels, they can sell their credit to other companies that emit more fossil fuels. And over the time, the cap will be reduced and it will force factories to reduce their greenhouse gases or to buy more credit in order to keep em emitting those greenhouse gases. And another way is by using carbon tax. And this basically makes carbon intensive activities and products more expensive. So things that require like coal, oil, and gas, they're gonna be more expensive. The, that way people are less likely to purchase them. And that way less greenhouse gases will be put out into the atmosphere. So what can we do to reduce greenhouse gases? As individuals, there are many different ways that we can make a difference to reduce greenhouse gases. We can start with uh, driving and flying less um, because that will reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that's going to the atmosphere because both driving and flying um, releases fossil fuels. We can buy energy efficient products such as uh, as much as possible. Um, this reduces the amount of times you have to purchase an item and that saves a lot of energy and it also reduces the amount of greenhouse gases from fossil fuels that are used to produce that item. We can use um, CFL light bulbs, which are compact fluorescent light bulbs. And these last 10 times longer than regular light bulbs and only, only use one third the amount of energy. And um, we don't wanna use too much energy. So by reducing the amount of energy, we're also reducing the amount of um, greenhouse gases that are emitted from the non-renewable energy, uh, energy resources. We can better insulate our homes and use less heating slash air conditioning. Um, this would just mean that we're, um, using less non-renewable energy um, because both processes um, use a lot of non-renewable energy and this would mean um, less greenhouse gases get emitted um, from the fossil fuels. We can take um, less hot showers and also take shorter showers. Uh, this would just take less energy to heat up the water and less energy to um, keep the shower going for a longer time. We can unplug items from outlets when we're not using them. So something you guys might not know is that when an item is plugged in, it uses vampire energy. Even if you're not using it, um, it still sucks out energy. Um, and that, um, that energy comes from uh, often greenhouse gases, or not greenhouse gases, but non-renewable energy sources, which emit greenhouse gases, such as CO2. Um, we can invest in renewable energy. So um, renewable energy does not emit any fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And some examples are solar panels, wind turbines, and hydroelectric energy in the form of dams. So maybe the Hoover Dam, if you guys know what that is, that is a um, hydroelectric um, dam. And um, 
those are just some of the most commonly used um, renewable uh, sources of renewable energy in the United States, but there's obviously many more. And if you guys are interested in uh, learning more about renewable energy, um, you can totally talk to one of us, you can email one of us, um, and we can send you some more information. We can plant trees because trees um, absorb CO2 in the atmosphere and CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And the last thing we can do is we can protest fossil fuel companies and support organizations that are fighting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and basically by, um, by protesting fossil fuel companies, it just means that we have a shot at um, reducing the amount of fossil fuels that are going out into the atmosphere and um, by and eventually using 100% um, uh, renewable energy and then also by supporting organizations that fight greenhouse gas emissions um, we can actually have a difference because we have the support of more people on our side um, got a question in the chat yeah what's your question Nathan we'll wait a few minutes or, well, wait a minute. Do you want us to answer your question at the end or do you want us to answer it right now? Okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. Um, but that's basically what we can do. So the importance of greenhouse gases to sustainability. Greenhouse gases are continuously contributing to climate change by trapping heat and accelerating global warming or making it happen faster. The current rate of global warming is unsustainable because it will result in temperature changes so high that we are likely to see mass extinction events of species of, on the planet, have a much harder time producing crops, lose many natural resources, and see sea levels rise so high that they can completely flood island nations or coastal cities. And the effects on us would be pretty radical just because, uh, for example, using our natural resources we wouldn't be able to drive cars because gas is finite and we run out of that um if coastal cities are flooded and like island nations we could there could be people who lose their jobs and lose where they live and suffer damages and then also for example um another one if a lot of species on the planet die then we would lose out on some food sources and and it would just really destroy like the ecosystem and the food webs that are in place at the moment but in order to prevent these events from happening, um, it's, we would need to decrease the global emissions of greenhouse gases by 80% by the year 2050. Though that seems like some people could argue like a long time from now, it actually is only in 30 years and we will probably are going to start experiencing the effects either really soon or like just in the next few years. And um, if we just don't, take any action to prevent this from happening our changes and like the damage to earth could be irreversible um and so it's important that we make changes now and try to work through it now as a as a community and as a group of people rather than just saving it for later until uh like 2045 where it's like wow the the world is already just destroyed like there's nothing we can do for now